All right, let's get into the word this morning. We are continuing in our sermon series entitled Jesus the Messiah. It is through this series that we are studying the gospel of Matthew. Uh, today we are continuing in Matthew chapter 22. We will be finishing Matthew 22 next Sunday. But for today, we're going to be concentrating primarily on verses 23 through 33. If you've brought your Bible and you'd like to go ahead and turn there. Now let's get the setting right. This is a continuation from where we left off last Sunday in that this is another attempt on the part of the Hebrew religious community or the Hebrew religious leadership to discredit Christ. Now last time it was the Pharisees and the Herodians who had uh, come after Christ. Uh, this morning we're going to see that it's the Sadducees. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into the scripture. Matthew 22 beginning with verse 23. That same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Now let me just stop here and uh, point out that Matthew makes mention that the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. Uh, that is, they didn't accept the doctrine of life after death. Uh, as you can probably guess, that detail is going to be relevant to this story. And so let's keep that in mind as we continue reading. Now picking up in Matthew 22, now verse 24. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. All right, stopping right there, let me say that technically speaking, technically speaking, the Sadducees were absolutely correct on this point. In Deuteronomy 25, Moses did stipulate that if a man should die without an heir to perpetuate his name, then his brother should marry the man's widow, and any children that were produced out of that union would then carry on the name of the dead man. Now, with that being said, this was not a practice that was unique to the Hebrews, on the contrary, uh, this was a practice that many cultures had adopted during that day and time. However, historians say that it was hardly ever actually used. And by Jesus' day, it had fallen into uh, disuse altogether. All right. Well, then let's keep reading. Now picking up uh, verse 25. Now then, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. Isn't that funny? You leave your wife to your brother. Never mind. The, <laughs> the same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. <laughs> Finally, the woman died. And then at the resurrection, then, now then at the resurrection, okay, I'm already messed up. All right, I'm sorry. I just, you know, it's just so funny to think you're going to leave your wife like you're leaving your, you know, possessions to your brother. Anyway, uh, now then at the resurrection, uh, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Okay, so I think we can all agree that this scenario is extreme to say the least. Um, and you might ask, well, where were they going with this line of questioning? Well, you might say that they were trying to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, number one, they were trying to discredit Christ, and we already know that. But number two, uh, while they were in the process of discrediting Christ, uh, they were also evidently trying to expose what they believed to be the absurdity of the resurrection. Uh, the foolishness of a resurrection doctrine, which was embraced uh, by other factions of the Hebrew religious community. Now, with that said, let's see how Christ responds. Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, he says, Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Let me repeat that. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Now, let's break that down. First of all, that word error. In this context, the word error is a very strong term implying mortal danger. The question itself 
was kind of foolish. But the direction or the premise of the question was dangerous. Now, why was it dangerous? Well, the Lord tells them. It's because the Sadducees did not know the scriptures and they did not know the power of God. What is the relevance here? It's simple. To not know the scriptures and to not know the power of God is to put yourself in mortal danger. Let me say that again. This is the emphasis of today's message. To not know the scriptures and to not know the power of God is to put yourself in a very dangerous, perilous position. Now, let's break this down into two things. Number one, knowing the scriptures. Uh, in, this context, in this context, the word know means to discern. Uh, which means that while the Sadducees may have had some intellectual understanding of the Scriptures, nevertheless, they lacked discernment of the Scriptures. That is, they lacked the ability to properly interpret the Scriptures and therefore properly apply the Scriptures. Case in point, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. But... On a broader scale, they believed that even if there was a resurrection, then it would be nothing more than the continuation of life as they knew it. Well, let me just stop and say that speaking for myself, I can't think of anything more uninspiring than to think that eternal life will just be a continuation of what I've already got. Now, don't misunderstand me. My life is not bad. I've, I've had a very good life. I'm living a good life now. But in terms of eternal life, I'm looking for something better. And I'm, I'm hoping that there is something better in respect to eternal life. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, you know how Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun, right? That things just recycle themselves. Well, I've shared this example before. Let me share it again. Uh, our oldest granddaughter, Gwen, uh, when she was 12, 13, somewhere in there, uh, I think it was for a birthday. I don't remember exactly what it was for. But anyway, she got a pair of bell-bottom jeans. And she was over the moon excited over those bell-bottom jeans. Can I share with you that about 50 or 55 years ago, I was excited over bell-bottom jeans. But I just got to tell you, this time around, they ain't doing anything for me. And so if eternal life means nothing more than bell-bottom jeans coming into style every 50 years or so, then no thank you. Count me out. I'm not interested in that. Uh, Jesus clarified that resurrection life would be very different from this current life. Look at what he goes on to say in Matthew 22, 30. He says, at the resurrection... People will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, let me just stop and say that we could spend a lot of time speculating on what Christ meant about us being like the angels in heaven at the resurrection. But that is a conversation for another day because this is not about the resurrection. Let's stay on task here. This is about the ability to discern the scriptures. And the inability to discern the scriptures is dangerous. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Christ repeatedly warned about false teachers who claimed to speak on God's behalf. They would prey on people who lacked 
the ability to discern the scriptures for themselves. And the end result was always the same. These false teachers would literally and figuratively strip their victims of everything of value. Christ could not have been more clear. Doctrinal error is dangerous. But more to the point, doctrinal error is commonplace. Look at what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, beginning with verse 3. He says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We are living in a day whereby the Christian who holds to the doctrine of Scripture is rebuffed as old-fashioned and backwards and difficult and intolerant. The more uh, a preferable approach in this day and time is to say, well, you know, it's okay if we don't agree on everything. You know, the most important thing is that we just get along and that we focus on the stuff uh, that we can agree upon and we just ignore the stuff that we can't agree upon. And granted, in in some respects, that mindset might be acceptable. But I think the real question here is, do you know the difference? Do you know when it's okay to disagree to agree to disagree versus when it's necessary to stand your ground. Sound doctrine mattered to Christ. We see in this example in Matthew 22 that it mattered so much to Christ that he was willing to take the time to correct the doctrinal error of a group of people who hated him. All because he knew that their error was pointing them on a destructive path. And so from our our story, there are at least two things we can learn concerning sound doctrine. Number one, sound doctrine is truth. It is not opinion. Sound doctrine is truth, not opinion. Alan Bloom authored a book entitled The Closing of the American Mind. And this is a quotation from his book. He says this, The intellectual community has relegated religion to the realm of opinion as opposed to knowledge. It is simply a matter of one subjective and uncertain opinion versus another. Undergirding this is the view that all truth is relative and that tolerance the chief virtue. In other words, we're living in a day whereby two people can hold opposite views on spiritual truth and both of them be right. Because somewhere, somebody, sometime decided that spiritual truth is subjective. In other words, that, you know, what works for one person may not work for another person. And you should just be okay with that. But look at what Paul writes in Titus 1.9. He said, but you must hold firmly. Hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. So that you can encourage others by sound doctrine. So that you can encourage others by sound doctrine. And look at this next part. And refute those who oppose it. It's not always okay to agree to disagree. God has called his people. To a place where we need to know the truth. Versus what is false. And we need to be able to stand for the truth. Paul advocated the necessity of standing your ground doctrinally. And in order to accomplish that end, you've got to be able to tell the difference between core doctrine and marginal doctrine. Let me share this with you. You know, there are some doctrines that are found in the scripture that are absolutely paramount. They are essential to your faith walk. Can we agree on that? 
There are other doctrines. Some of them may be perhaps found in the scripture and some of them found in man or tradition or culture that are not worth your time. And then there are still other doctrines that are sandwiched in those two extremes. And, and the responsibility is, and, and let me just say this. I want you to hear me, Hewitt Community Church family. It is your responsibility. It is not my responsibility. It, it is your, now, okay, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to do my part. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm willing to do my part to help. But nevertheless, at the bottom, at the bottom line is, it is your responsibility to know the difference where biblical doctrines are concerned. It is your responsibility, not my responsibility, to know where biblical doctrines reside on the scale of importance from 1 to 10. Christ viewed the doctrine of the resurrection as a core issue. Now, why is that? Well, among other things, to deny the resurrection is to remove any incentive for holy living. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. He said, now if there is no resurrection, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Well, i got to say I agree with Paul on that. You know, if there is no resurrection, why are we knocking ourselves out with righteous living? But because we hold to the resurrection doctrine as truth and not just as somebody's opinion... We are motivated to live as Christ has commanded us to live. And so sound doctrine is truth. It is not just opinion. And for you to understand and to discern sound doctrine, you've got to know the truth. Now that brings me to a second thing concerning sound doctrine, and that is this. Sound doctrine comes only from properly interpreted Scripture. It's with that in mind, let me take you back to our story in Matthew 22. Now picking up in verse 31, Jesus is still speaking here, here. And he says, but about the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, let me just say that this statement highlights a huge mistake that the Sadducees made in their resurrection doctrine. And it is this. They tried to build a resurrection doctrine. Or the lack thereof. On the foundation of marital law. In other words. They tried to formulate a belief system. On the resurrection. Based on what the Bible had to say about marriage. Well that makes absolutely no sense. That, that's like trying to study American history with an, an English composition book. They don't, they don't correlate together. Why would anybody do that? Well, I think that 2 Peter 3.16 gives us an idea. Let's look at this together. Uh, he writes, The ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction the scriptures. The ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction the scriptures. In other words, there will always be people, and, and I think we always know this, I think that we are aware of this, that there will always be people who will try to manipulate the scriptures to their own liking and to their own end. Now, you'd think it would be obvious that, you know, if you're going to build a resurrection doctrine for yourself, then you would start by looking at what the Bible had to say on the subject of the resurrection. Wow. What a concept. And that's what Christ was trying to do. But because of ignorance, which is, by the way, defined as the neglect of the scriptures. And then instability, which is defined as the insubordination of the scriptures. People start elsewhere. They start where they want to start. And in so doing, come up with all kinds of doctrines covering all kinds of things. Case in point, the Sadducees. They were trying to build a resurrection doctrine on marital law. It makes no sense. And Christ, again, he's trying to correct this. He's attempting to, 
I, it is amazing to me that he cared this much about where these people were going. These people wanted to kill him. And yet, he loved them so much that he was still interested in engaging with them to try to reorient them in the right direction. Isn't that amazing? That's not what this is about so much, but it just fascinates me that the Lord would take the time to engage these people. And, and he does it by trying to reorient them on what the scriptures have to say on the subject of the resurrection. And I love the way that he goes about it. Um, a detail concerning the Sadducees is um, they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as actual divine scripture. They did not accept the poetic books. They did not accept uh, the prophets as divine. And, and so uh, Christ, as I see it, is saying, okay, fine, let's start there. If, if that's all you accept, then let's just start there. And so he points to Moses' encounter with God in the wilderness, what we know as the burning bush experience. And, and in so doing, Christ reminds them of what God said to Moses, I am, not I was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, keep in mind, in Moses' day, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had long been dead. But in this application, God himself was confirming that they were, in fact, still very much alive. And he was still very much their God. Which explains what Christ says next in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32. He says, he is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. And I would say that to you this morning. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. Again, I would refer you to what he said to us during the worship time. I am nearer to you than you think. Now, with that said, that brings us to the Sadducees' second error. They didn't know the scriptures and they didn't know the power of God. Now, with that in mind, let me take you to Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel records this same story in Luke chapter 20, uh, beginning with verse 35. Jesus says, Those who are in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die. Now, let me just notice, I want you to notice that word and. The word and can be uh, interchanged with the word because. And so if you were reading that again, it would go something like this. Those in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage because they can no longer die. Now that sort of changes the landscape, in my opinion, of what Christ was saying. Uh, this is sort of a detail, and I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail here, but what it implies is that marriage in this context was about replenishing the earth about procreation. And, and the reason that procreation was necessary is, and is, is still necessary is because of sin and death. If people don't marry and make babies, then because of sin and death, eventually the earth would be uninhabited. But Jesus is pointing out that if the resurrection Procreation and marriage will not necessarily be necessary because there will be no sin and death. Now, I know that's a rabbit trail, but, but let's don't miss the point here. This is not about the resurrection. This is not about marriage and the resurrection. This is not about making babies in the resurrection. This is about the power of God eradicating sin and death. Now, okay, no, 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 no. Listen, you're not getting it. This is about the power of God eradicating sin and death. Did you know that in the resurrection, you will never have to worry about sin? You will never have to worry about decay? And you will never have to worry about separation from death ever again? You will never live under that cloud. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of God. And personally speaking, the older I get, the more that attention gets my detail. That detail gets my attention. And I can't even speak. I'm so excited. The point is this. Your life, your life depends upon sound doctrine. Uh, Luke 20, beginning with verse 46, Christ goes on to say, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. Yet they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Now to whom was Christ referring? Well, among others, he was referring to the Sadducees. And yet he cared enough about them to correct their doctrinal errors. However, he was under no illusions as to why they were in error. They refused to believe the power of God's word. You know, there is a difference between somebody who is in error out of ignorance versus someone who's in error out of defiance. With the former, that is somebody who doesn't know any better. You know, a patient, more gentle approach is probably best while with the latter, somebody who does know better, it's probably essential to be stronger and a bit firmer. But the real point is this. We must never, ever, in this church or in your home, you must never, ever allow doctrinal error to go unchecked. Because wherever you have doctrinal error, you will have sin. Let me close with this. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Among other things, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 reminds us that doctrinal error can still pervade our churches. The most prevalent error being the illusion that one can attain eternal life through good works, through religious service. But the Bible has not changed, nor will it ever change. Good works will simply never be enough. The only basis you will ever have for eternal life will be faith in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, today is... A very special Sunday here at Hewitt Community Church in that today is Communion Sunday. And let me just say that if you are a first-time guest, we welcome you here among us this morning. And we would invite you to observe communion with us today. However, we must make one stipulation. And that stipulation is you must have a personal relationship with God that is only made possible through faith in Christ and in the work of Christ. Romans 10 9 says that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now notice those two stipulations. Number one, you must declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Let me inform you that to declare that Jesus is Lord with your mouth is a form of agreement. By declaring that Jesus is Lord, you are publicly stating that everything that the Bible says about who Jesus is, is true. You are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who Jesus is and about who God is. But most importantly in this application, you are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who you are. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our hearts are deceptive. So deceptive that we don't even understand ourselves. That's just a religious way of saying that left to ourselves, there is no limit to the depths of sin that we can fall into. That's not a pleasant thing to say. That's not a, a comfortable thing for the Bible to say about you and me, but it's true. And the reason the Bible says it is so that you will know that you desperately need a Savior. And that Savior is found in none other than Jesus Christ. Now, the second stipulation of Romans 10, 9, is that you must believe in your heart. And that's, that can be tough. 
Believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead. Now, what is that all about? Well, in simple terms, that means this. Once you declare that Jesus is Lord, then you agree that you're going to do things Jesus' way as opposed to your own way. That's what he meant when he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. you got to do things my way. But here's where the problem lies. Doing things God's way or Christ's way is not just a matter of willpower. Because, see, there's still that matter of sin and that deceptive heart that we live with. And so in order to combat that, Romans 8 tells us that when we accept Christ as Lord, when we declare that he is Lord, that there is a spiritual transformation that takes place. You may not sense it, you may not feel it, but the Bible says it takes place nevertheless. And that is that God sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as very powerful. So powerful that it was able to raise a dead body back to life after three days in the grave. If it can raise a dead body back to life after three days in the grave, then that same spirit can help you to do things God's way. But now let me just clarify something here. That's a cooperative effort. The Holy Spirit is going to do his part, but you've got to do your part. What is your part? Well, you've got to get into this word every day. Every day, even if it's just five or ten minutes, you got to get into the Word. Number two, you got to spend time in prayer. Let me tell you what prayer is. All it is is you're talking to God. You know, through the Word, He talks to you. Through prayer, you talk to Him. That's as simple as it gets. And then finally, number three, you, you need to spend time with God's people. And you need to spend time in God's house. Because it's in God's house that you get doctrinal truth. And it's in God's house that you get the encouragement that you need to keep on going. See, living the Christian life is hard. Can somebody say amen? Oh, come on now. Am I the only one that struggles in this church? <laughs> living the Christian life is hard. And I agree, with, I agree with what Paul said. If there's no resurrection, then why am I beating my brains out? But we're beating our brains out because we believe what this word says. And, and, and sometimes I can do it on my own, but there's a lot of times when I need encouragement and you need encouragement. And that's the reason why we do what we do this morning. Meeting together and praying together and studying the word together. This is what this is about. So that we can keep on going. And so that someday we can all enjoy the resurrection and the resurrection life together. Amen. Amen. And so before we go any further... I'd like to ask that you would pray this prayer with me. Now, let me qualify this. There is no magic in these words, none at all. But I do believe that there is a transformative power and spirit that when this prayer is prayed earnestly, Romans 10, 9 takes place. And so I'd like to ask that you would pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that your word is true. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he was born of a virgin. I believe he lived a perfect life. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again so that I may have forgiveness of my past, abundant life for my today, and eternal life for my tomorrow. Therefore, I declare with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And so I ask you to forgive me for my sin and to give me a new heart. I ask you to take control of my life and point me in the direction that you'd have me go. Thank you for doing this in Jesus' name.